Support for the Langcast is provided by Winey Way Books and Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Welcome to the Langcast. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slusser. On this episode, we are honored to be invited by Pennsylvania College of Art and Design to be part of the acknowledgement of the Poetry Path Project on their campus. While there, we had the opportunity to hear from some of the key coordinators behind the Poetry Path Project. The first time I saw this grant proposal was the day before proposals were due, and we were actually applying for the same grant. But when I saw uh, the Poetry Path proposal, I went right to our academic team and said, you know what? If we don't get this grant, we gotta, we've got to partner with this, with the Poetry Pass, because it sounds like a great idea. We were also fortunate to speak with the poet and artists involved in the installation at Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. Um, we think of something like faith and doubt as two different things most of the time, I think. But I, I think that if we are doubting, we are engaged with faith in some way. We're thinking about faith. And uh, I took these statements that, on one hand, could be proclamations, right? Uh, A sort of poem of praise, you know, uh, who uh, who remembers, who knows us. Uh, They they could could be an ode on some level. And uh, at the same time, they're questions. Enjoy the conversation. Well, everyone, welcome to the show. If you could just go around and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Carrie Sharon Wright, and I'm the director of the Philadelphia Alumni Writers' House at Franklin and Marshall College and the founder of Poetry Paths. I'm Mary Colleen Heil, the president of Pennsylvania College of Art and Design. I'm Tracy Cutler. I'm the chief communication officer at the Lancaster County Community Foundation. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what Poetry Path is, how it got together. Well, uh, it's funny, as I was coming over here, I started thinking about how you could describe poetry paths, and there's a long explanation and a short one. And I think the short one is that we build connections, we build or we're creating new connections in the city of Lancaster through poetry and art. Um, We received a grant from the Lancaster County Community Foundation to do two things. We offer poetry writing workshops in Lancaster public schools um, for about 300 children a year. And then we also uh, have been working with site partners around the city, including the very venerable and vital Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, to um, create and install pieces of public art that feature poetry throughout the city. So that's that's Poetry Paths in a nutshell. But what we really do is we, we get to work with all these creative people all over the city, including... You, you know, young poets who are in second and third grade and people who are working artists like Route 222 um, and uh, site partners who have agreed to take on the responsibility of having a piece of public art in the city of Lancaster and lots of advisors and people with strong and good opinions about what should happen here. Um, and then we just work with all of them to try and make this project happen. So that's we're facilitators, I guess, is the best way to put it. So what is uh, Pennsylvania College of Art and Design's major role? Well, we are one of the sites, and we have a a project that was... Well, let me back up a minute and tell you that the first time I saw this grant proposal was the day before proposals were due, (laughs) and we were actually applying for the same grant. But when I saw uh, the, the Poetry Pass proposal, I went right to our academic team and said, you know what? If we don't get this grant, we gotta, we've got to partner with this, with the Poetry Pass, because it sounds like a great idea. And as soon as we saw it, we said, great idea. And so what we've been doing is we've been trying to bring together as many of the college's people with the community and to find a site on our building, and we did. It's sort of hidden on our building. And uh, we set up a committee internally, and we worked with Route 222, three of our alums, to actually do the interpretation of the poem and have had a lot of meetings with people in the community about this and have spent um, quite a lot of time. um, There was logistical time, but there's also a lot of time talking about the importance of poetry and the importance of these poems. And uh, 
one of our faculty members, um, Linda King Brown, is was our poetry liaison. She's from our liberal arts department, and so we had a good connection between not only our studio art departments, but uh, with our liberal arts departments as well. How many pieces are included in this project? Um, we have 14 site partners, um, and right now two two of the sites are up. So Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, the portico here, and then also Tabor Community Services has a piece of sculpture that's called the Eastern Market Bench that's been installed in front of their building on, on uh, East King Street. And then we're in the process of, um, we've got agreements with artists for about eight other sites, and then there are artists who are already working on their pieces for um, Spanish American Civic. Well, I could list all of them, but it'll kind of go on and on. Do you mind if I mention something about how we chose the poetry here? Oh, because that do. might be, I just please realized do. that I please didn't explain. Mm -hmm. What we did for each of the sites was we came up with a public art process or public art style process for choosing the poems and choosing the art. And every site had a different approach. So here at, at PCAD, um, Mary Colleen and her community selected the artist from the array of really talented artists who are among the alumni. We were very excited to have you choose Route 222. Um, we did a public call for poems for the text for Poetry Paths at PCAD. And uh, we sent that call out nationally to poets all over the country. And on the list, I happened to include the name of Mary Shebist because I had been told by a woman I respect very much, Professor Katie Ford at Franklin and Marshall College, that Mary Shebist is one of the greatest young poets in the country and that um, we should try to bring her for a reading. And I thought, oh, I'll just throw her email on there. And then she bit um, and she sent us <laughs> some poems. And when her poem came in, I remember thinking, well, then this is what we're talking about. Um, this is what we were hoping for because it's just a brilliant poem. And it had already been on Poetry Daily. There were lots of other great poems that came in. I should say it wasn't, but in my mind, it rose to the top. And then, as it happened, the selection committee for PCAD, which I was not a member of, um, also loved it. And the artist loved it. And uh, I think you can see it's a poem that you want to read again and again and again. And you puzzle over some of the lines. And you wonder who the who is. Um, so it's the kind of thing that you would want to come back to. It's perfect for a piece of public art because you don't want to read it once and then never look at it again. You actually want to re-encounter it. So we still feel, I still feel really lucky that I happened to have Mary's email. She didn't, I didn't know her. So hi. <laughs> I'm just meeting her today. So. <laughs> now Tracy, what's yeah. the Lancaster County Community Foundation's involvement? Oh, well, I'll tell you. Well, I, First of all, I'll just say I think that Poetry Paths is an incredibly sophisticated project, and it um, it says a lot about the Lancaster community that we have been able to, you know, with the help of of, of Carrie and and her guidance, be able to bring together so many facets of poetry and art and pieces of our community that may not have been connected in any other way. And that's really part of the Community Foundation's role. We are about creating extraordinary community. We are looking for ways to make long-term investments in Lancaster County to make it a vibrant and, and successful place to live. So really about five years ago, we were having conversations in the community about, you know, what's the next thing we need to do? What's something that's at a tipping point in Lancaster that we can invest dollars that will really help create a long-term sustainable impact? And the arts were identified as that. So the Community Foundation made a, you know, several million dollar three-year investment in the arts. And that has shown up in lots of different ways um, through other projects. And one of the major projects was Poetry Paths. And so it's very exciting to see it come to life now and know that it's creating the sustainable path that will be connecting facets as diverse as the College of Art and Design and Tabor Community Services and the Spanish American Civic Association in a way that is transcendent um, for all of us in our community and um, really connects us through the power of, of art. Mm -hmm. So it's really an exciting project and um, gives a lot of power to Lancaster. Uh, yeah, I know you, you spoke a little bit how you chose the uh, uh, poet. What was the process in, in the artists, and how did you bring the artists together with the poet? Yeah, every site has a different way of choosing their art. So okay. Keystone Art and Culture Center is using their in-house artists to do their piece. Mm. And we proposed a poem for them. Tabor Community Services actually had already selected an artist to do a piece of sculpture. And then we met with him before he did the design and asked him if he'd be interested in incorporating poetry. And he said yes. Um, Spanish American Civic Association has, has um, 
uh, been working with an artist named um, Jared Bader, who's a muralist from Philadelphia, who works with the Philadelphia Mural Arts Program. And he did a design for them that they selected. And he came and he took pictures of their whole community. And the images in the mural are all of Spanish American Civic Association clientele, staff, <coughs> community members. So it's every piece has a kind of different genesis and a different flavor, I guess. And the poem at Saca, just to give one example, um, is by a local poet named Paracio Asensio, and it's in Spanish. Um, and I'm going to butcher the title if I say it's un seed. I can't say it. <laughs> a fertile seed. Okay. So. One thing I really like about Poetry Paths <clears throat> is that I, I think there's a sense that poetry is a little bit beyond some of us or above some of us. And I really like the way, I mean, just the nature of it, because it's sitting on our streets, um, it makes it so accessible. And it mm -hmm. invites our community to be part of it, because many of us wouldn't necessarily read a poem. And already, the excitement around people seeing poetry, and I know one of the poets, Lee Hinton, who wrote the poem at Clipper Magazine Stadium, had a chance to read his read his work at one of the games. And I think that's pretty mm -hmm. extraordinary. It's not a lot of communities that are raising up poets and celebrating that as a mm -hmm. as a as a way to celebrate the community. It was funny after he read his poem, we collected public comment on the proposals for that site at the game at a barnstormers game a couple of weeks ago. And after he read his poem, all these people were coming up to me and revealing that they were either closet poets or they were or their sons or daughters were closet poets or they had taken a poetry writing workshop or they actually had a whole box of poems at home and uh so it was it was kind of like living in LA like everybody has a screenplay i felt like oh check it out like every <laughs> every other person here is a poet oh um, and that was can i just comment also yeah. on um Poetry Paths is, this is Poetry Paths in the streets that we're talking about, but Poetry Paths in the schools is the other element where students are working with, with poets and, you know, we had the chance to go and see some of the young student poets read their work at a celebration in the spring and that's another extraordinary experience and Poetry Paths has produced a book that highlighting illustration and poetry from these students and it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's another way. And I think that's something, um, you know, from a community foundation perspective, that's the kind of thing that is, is setting roots in our community about the importance of art and really cultivating creative thinkers. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that can change a community. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention one of the reasons, the reasons why we picked Route 222. And that was largely because they're, they're, grad, they're alumni of the college and they do very interesting work with a very interesting um, uh, allegorical twist to it. But they, we also wanted, we also liked them because they work collaboratively. There are three of them and they work together. And if you go on their website, you can, or on YouTube, you can find, you could watch them actually working and to see artists working like that together, almost like they've been choreographed, but they haven't been choreographed. They're they're working together because they know how to work together is really a lesson for all of us and also a lesson for our students as well. I'd like to talk a little bit about public art, community art in general. What's the process and um, community actual involvement past the artists? In these in these projects, mm -hmm. it d again, it depends on the site. So um, let's see, for... Brightside Opportunity Center, the community that we reached out to is the staff and the senior citizens group at Brightside. And they, they chose a piece of scripture to use for their piece of art. And then we did a workshop with their, um, with their youth group in the evening with a poet named Major Jackson. And he came and led a workshop. And some of the poems that came out of that workshop were also submitted. And the group asked us to pick the poem, um, a poem that could be used. And as it happened, we picked a poem by a young poet. Uh, and then it turned out when we went back to the group and said, well, this is the one that we really love. Um, he was somebody who had been writing for a long time and then stopped after death in his family. 
and um, and had started writing again, but he was also very beloved by the whole community of Brightside. He's really engaged in the youth group. So that was a happy accident. Um, and then we asked the community to look at samples of art from people who had sent, re- answered our call for qualifications, which we also sent out nationally. And as it happened, the Brightside group chose two dudes which is a local painting company that also does murals, and not knowing that they were two dudes. They just saw this collection of murals, and they said, wow, we really love this person's, this artist's work. And so they chose two dudes after, you know, again, we weren't involved in it, but they had a conversation. And now Peter Barber and Lisa Gawker of Two Dudes are going in a couple of times to meet with the community there, show them proposals, and talk about what the piece will be like. Um, some other places, Shriner Concord, we just had a big session of public comment um, where we collected comments from people all over the country because Shriner Concord is the burial place of Thaddeus Stevens and there are people all over the world who feel ownership of that site. Um, and so we, we put it in the paper. You know, there's an article in the paper and then we got lots and lots of feedback from people about proposals that had been delivered by two artists who were chosen almost the same way that Brightside folks were. The selection committee for, for Shriner narrowed it down to two, and then those two were given the chance to produce proposals. So I don't know if this is answering your question, but it kind of depends on the site. A public art process can take many sh- forms, but what we learned when we were first setting this whole thing up was that for every site, you need to have a set of stakeholders and then you also need to work with them to figure out what they would like, how much input they want, and what kind of public comment they want. And do they want, in some community projects, not one that we're doing, but key, at Keystone, they've done a really great project where they actually, everything in the, in the project is decided by a fairly large committee of neighbors, you know, to put in a poem in a, I think, a poetry park. We have a narrower scope that's more modeled after uh, other kinds of, um, public art processes where you have a selection committee and you collect public comment, but there are decision makers who are invested in the neighborhood. If someone wanted to uh, get in touch or, or learn more about each of your roles here, uh, where could uh, where could they go to find that information? Um, I would send them to www.poetrypaths.org, and there's a link to our, our email address, and also you can find out about everything that's happening. Um, or they can send emails directly to me at uh, carrie.sharonwright at fnm.edu, which they can find on the webpage, too. The college, you can go to our website, which is www.pcad.edu, and we have a, a section on not only this, but we also have been maintaining a, uh, a public art uh, section as well on our uh, because we've been dealing with public art and public murals for a long time here. You can reach the Community Foundation at the website, which is lankfound, L-A-N-C-F-O-U-N-D dot org, and learn more about building community through the arts and also about our new project, which is called the AHA Project, which is Creative Solutions to Real Problems. We're going to head to break. When we come back, we're going to talk with the artists involved with the Poetry Path. It's a fact. Solid human resource practices will prosper an organization. Employees who are on the same page with their leadership, know their jobs, know what is expected of them, and focus on their strengths, will exceed every company's wild and lofty expectation. Proper HR practice will increase productivity, improve quality, eliminate employee relations issues, and reduce absenteeism. Let Mark at In His Name HR improve your human resources process and develop them if you don't have them. Know a company that needs help? No worries. Call Mark at 717-572-2183 or visit him on the web at www.inhisnamehr.com. You'll be glad you did. And we're back with the artists. Uh, Do you guys want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Anthony Mark from Route 222. Sean Warner, Route 222. I'm Derek Hedinger, a Route 222. I'm Mary Shebist. I'm a poet. So Mary, your poetry is the center of what's been done here at PCA and D. Can do, would you mind reading it to us sure. and explaining okay. your inspiration? Who is enough? Who is more than enough? 
Who should be extolled with our sugared tongues? Who knows us in our burnished windshields as we pass? Who remembers the honey-colored husks of the locust? Who knows the scent of dust, the scent of each sparrow? Whose shadow does not flicker under streetlights? Who can feel without exaggerating anything? Who will care when the iridescent flies swarm toward us? Who shall be as the wings of the dove its coppery shadows? Who waits in the midst of the mosquitoes? Who devoured the fruit of our ground, the skin of the overripe pears? Who saw the world incarnadined, the current flowing? Whose face is electrified by its own light? Who could be a piece of flame, a piece of mind shimmering? Who can feel without eroticizing everything? Who will pity us when the bees disappear into their shadows? Who loves the dank earth, its wolves and its tigresses? Who has tried to reach us? Who will do anything to reach us? Who is enough? And the poem is called All Times and All Tenses Alive in This Moment. And the poem began with an interest in um, trying to work with faith and doubt simultaneously. Um, you know, one of the things I love about the space of a poem is, um, unlike, I think, what we're often called to do in the world is to sort of take sides, decide this or that. Are you part of this or that? Will you go this way or that way? Um, a poem is a space where you don't have to choose. It's a space to, um, to meditate. It's a space to think. It's a space to wonder. And um, we think of something like faith and doubt as two different things most of the time, I think. Um, but I, I think that if we are doubting, we are engaged with faith in some way. We're thinking about faith. And so I, was, uh, I took these statements that on one hand could be proclamations, right? Uh, a sort of poem of praise. Um, you know, uh, who, uh, who remembers, who knows us. Uh, they, they could, it could be an ode on some level. Um, and uh, at the same time, they're questions. Uh, so that sort of absence at the center is a real doubt. Either it's being described or it's being questioned. Um, and they're simultaneous acts here. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I've been interested in this uh, tradition of prayer called Via Negativa that talks about um, you can't know what God is, so you can only know what God is not, so you get the negative in order to try to think about the positive. This is, I think, um, has a relationship to that tradition, but it's more focused on questions rather than the absolute negative. Um, and it took me a while to arrive at the form of a circle. Um, for a long time, the poem was in lines, the way most poems are. But I more and more began to think of the poem as, a, um, as, a, as, as, as at least having a relationship to a prayer tradition. And I actually thought about um, a textbook. Um, and there's a textbook written by Helen Vendler, and she's trying to describe a poem by the um, 17th century poet George Herbert. And she arranges that poem this way on the page to help get students to learn <laughs> how the poem is organized and how it's working, even though it's not literally a circle. So she puts prayer in the middle, and then she shows how every um, modifying phrase in the poem is just describing prayer. So land of spices, something understood, they're all modifying the same thing. And I thought, well, that actually is a great visual form <laughs> that does what I'm interested in. So I sort of took that inspiration from, from her and um, tried the, the, um, the circular 
sunburst kind of form. That's very interesting to hear about how you put it together. Since it's a very uh, unique starburst thing that we we don't I am not familiar with. I'm not sure many people walking by if they will or not should catch the eye. And the way that it's done, you really don't know where it starts and it ends. Right. How do you how do you feel that about that take? Well, that was that was the appeal of the form, right? Because when it's in lines, um, there's a start and there's a finish, and you direct your reader in a very clear way. And part of the excitement for me about this form is that uh, I don't think, I think it, for me, the poem works e- almost equally well no matter where you begin or end. And, and that was what I loved about it, that, that openness and that openness to a reader to land on um, anywhere and begin or just stay there. I mean, the, it doesn't necessarily feel like you even have to, to me, go all the way around. <laughs> you, know, you can just sort of land on any moment and, and linger there. So the, that form was very integral to the experience that I wanted for the poem. Do you ever change where you begin it? You know, that was yourself. actually the first time I've read it out loud. I've never read it out loud before for okay. anyone. Okay. So, uh, well, wow. <laughs> it sounded sounded great. Uh, <laughs> but I, I know for me, like if I would read the when I'm reading this, I, I you said about starting anywhere and anywhere is perfect. I would just uh, depending on the mood I was in for the, for the day, I'd, I'd start it at a different spot. And I just was curious if you ever read over your work and and just depending on the. Uh, the inspiration you're having that there, the mood you're in, do you just kind of, oh, I'm going to start it here, I'm going to leave this part out, you know, I don't know. <laughs> oh, when I reread it? Yeah. Yeah, I think I've, I've picked it up and started and ended a variety of places. I was curious, you said that you started at a particular moment? That was purely by logistics of the power. Oh, okay. We had to make, basically we had to make sure our math worked. So we okay. had to take the longest line and go, is this going to work? Right. And sure enough, it did. <laughs> but what's interesting was there's such a strong spiritual quality to the piece that Anthony actually, as we were doing the lettering, sort of created a ceremony out of it where it came the, the north line, the north bar came in first, then south. And we actually sort of went in and he sort of did directional ceremony yeah. and we ended on the east to sort of invoke the new beginnings. Oh, lovely. Yeah, so. Well, before we move on to the art section, I just want to say that my personal reading of it is almost like it, it just never ends. It, when you get around, you're almost back to where you started That's right. questioning and, and answering the same things over and over again. That's very much how, I guess, um, in prayer, even your you can, your relationship with God can go. So. No, I, I, that's right, and I think you know there there are multiple paths. <laughs> there's not there's not a correct beginning or ending or or middle necessarily, and that's why the one choice I made when I read it right now was uh, I I uh, ended it ended reading in the middle of a line, even uh, so that I began with one line and read the whole thing. But when I came back, I actually started that be- the beginning of the line again to to reinforce that circularity. How did you guys take this and then come up with a visual design? Yeah, well, I think right away, I mean, it's very clearly a solar form to the poem. And the main thing was really just to maintain the integrity of that form because it's so beautiful. And the poem is so beautiful. We were really, to just really quickly defer to what was being said earlier about the selection of the poetry. We had a say in it, and fortunately, we got to sit in on it. And it was, when we saw it, we're like, this is the one. So I just wanted to throw that in there, how thrilled we were that this was it ended up being the poem. Digressing, however, uh, I think that the, the, the solar form really was so obvious that it was about accentuating that and sort of pulling that out, and um, all the different spiritual tradi- traditions that use the the sun, uh, which is genuinely everyone we could possibly find on Earth, and how that was visually communicated kind of became part of the design. Installing this, you're you're painting or working on a ceiling. Was there any any problem with you know trying to keep your hands up in the air and uh, uh, going down and doing some stretches and <laughs> it was pretty strenuous I'd say after uh, the lettering was the most um, the most strenuous just being up there all the time like it didn't you know just like this these muscles and this but. <laughs> how long did how long did it take you guys to uh, well we spent two days on the lettering okay. so that was and how many hours a day were you 
Oh, those days were, <laughs> they were like 12 or 14 hour days. Wow. They were long yeah. days. That was intense. Yeah. <laughs> the whole project was intense. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it's a pretty big project to do in such a short amount of time. But it was, it was basically five and a half days, six days, yeah, give, five and a half, give or take, six. to, to get the whole thing. It was an average of nine to ten hours with lunch break. Route 222, how did you guys form? Uh, we actually were uh, three roommates um, our freshman year at uh, this college, Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, and uh, we just lived together. On this very street, on, on, on Prince Street, street uh, we were roommates just a block Abraham. away, which is a continuation of, of Route 222, oh, 222. The, the road. So it's we've always kind of been connected by that road, and yeah. hence the name. That's, 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 that's yeah. going to be my next question. We continue to be. <laughs> it's just, I can't work with these guys without getting on Route 222 and driving north. It's yeah. It continues to be how we're connected. So it's a good name. Yeah, yeah. And our, yeah like our name, like the number just uh, follows us. 222 is everywhere. Like we live on the road. It takes us everywhere. <laughs> it's in everything. Uh, it can be a bit of a... You know, like a, a neurotic thing if you <laughs> if you don't let it out of your head. Um, but you can find the number anywhere, and it just it's a, like it's in everything. Times, addresses, every number, and it's just always followed us. And so we took the pun off of the interstate route 22. Um, excuse me, like the interstate like route 222, and just did R O O T like roots and culture to keep um, like the spiritual story, you know, and do it like that. Very cool. Now, so three of you work simultaneous on a project, how do you divide up the work and decide who takes what kind of things? There's almost never any discussion about it. When we're doing a project of this scale where there's such a tight time frame and there's so many people involved, we actually for once kind of delegated a little bit of labor, which is unusual for us. But for the most, even still, it's, it's just a matter of what, what makes sense. I mean, it, the conversation is still incredibly brief, like, I'll take this, okay, move on. You know, there's, there's not much delegation that happens. It, it's 90%. It's like a bit of a dance. It's just we know each other so well. We almost think as one when we get together. And so there isn't a lot of bumping. It's always just everybody knows what they're to do and everybody does it right. The, the process, it's, it's actually come to the point where we, we've started referring to this sort of fourth artist right. that sort of is the person or the thing that is steering the work and the project. And that's why the poem is so incredible because it sort of it references this fourth person that we always feel is sort of making this all happen you know because yeah. um, oftentimes um, we'll step back from a piece we just made and we're like what the? you know there's so many connections and, and, and there's a narrative that's been developed without us communicating to each other at all that's kind of astonishing and that's we sort of credit that authorship to whomever uh, the, the poem happens to be about I suppose now this is a question for all four artists how does it feel to have your work displayed in such a permanent manner it's an absolute honor. Yeah, it's thrilling. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's thrilling. Uh, I mean, I think as as artists, as much as you know, um, when you sit down to do it, it's not necessarily about an audience. But but one, of course, is completely honored by having a listener on the other side, or or a watcher, or somebody receiving, and it's thrilling. Yeah. At the end of the day, creative people ultimately make stuff to go, ooh, look what I did. You know, that's what this is all about. I mean, no matter how much it's about teaching things about yourself and all these important things that come into making work, at the end of the day, you're still kind of a little kid that says, well, you know, can you put this in the fridge? You know? So this is like the biggest fridge in town. It's right. great. Yeah. 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 Poetry Pass was talking about connections. Yeah. And I think that's largely what art longs to do, is to, is to make connections. So the opportunity to be in a public place place just offers a whole lot more opportunity for those connections. Well, we want to thank Pennsylvania College of Art and Design for bringing us here to cover this story. Uh, how can people get in touch with Route 222 and uh, you, Mary? Uh, you can get in touch with me. Uh, um, I'm on the website where I teach, Lewis and Clark College. So you can go to the English Department website at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Uh, you can come to our website, uh, route222.com, and uh, we have a contacts page there that uh, will guide you to us. Or we're on Facebook or, you know. Yeah, I'd also like us. to say we have a Tumblr page that if you want immediate stuff, oftentimes we'll do live events where we'll paint. If you go there, you can actually see us make work in real time. We'll post stuff as we're making things. So if you go to R O O T 222 
www.tumblr.com. You can find lots of stuff there, too. And I believe someone mentioned the YouTube page earlier. Uh, what's the username for that? The quickest way to get to that is to go to ROOT222.com and go to the TV link. And there's a whole slew of videos that will sort of that we can all kind of guide you to our stuff. And that's the way to do it. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We hope you've been enjoying the Lancast. This episode was produced by myself, David Moulton, with show notes by Keith and Lawrence Lesser. All pertinent links to this episode can be found in the show notes at thelancast.com. If you specifically like this episode, we ask that you consider making a donation. Every little bit helps. Even a dollar a show can keep us going. If you'd like to help support us, you can do so by going to thelancast.com slash donate. And don't forget to subscribe in iTunes and tell a friend about the show. So, for the Lancast, I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slesser. Asking, are you in the cast? Yeah.